Okay. Um, well, uh, my name's Dave DePauli. I'm from Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'd like to give you an overview of uh, modeling and simulation and how it relates to the fuel recycling processes you've been hearing about for the last couple of days. Whoops. Okay. All right, I'll learn. <clears throat> okay, so basically an outline of what I'm going to talk about is first give a, kind of a historical uh, view of some of the applications that were done and then uh, basically the state of, uh, of things a few years ago, basically what were the key research needs and then how we're advancing to the future and primarily talking uh, uh, what has been done in the past few years in the any advanced modeling and simulation program. I don't need to say too much about this, uh, basically, because you've been hearing about this. Uh, but as we go forward and we're, we're uh, uh, developing new uh, fuel cycle processes, uh, we're go obviously going to see that we m need to meet both our, our product goals, but also we need to stay within uh, constraints, environmental safety and, uh, and accountability constraints. And uh, emerging modeling and simulation capabilities uh, can take a role to help improve the development and implementation of these processes. Uh, you know, modeling and simulation uh, can have many benefits, uh, reducing the cost of R&D, uh, for instance, uh, minimizing the amount of, exp of costly experimentation uh, by allowing you to compare different separations processes, different s fuel cycle strategies, uh, developing your chemical processes with lower cost accelerate the work. Uh, when you move on to system design, you uh, could use uh, 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 models to help uh, develop designs with reduced design margins, allow you to scale up with greater confidence, um, and uh, increase safety and uh, perhaps acceptance of regulatory bodies if you can then fully explore uh, 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 different operating spaces with, with models. Okay, so uh, just stepping back, what is modeling and simulation? You hear this a lot. Modeling, a lot of people do modeling. You know, if you sit down and you do a little Excel spreadsheet, you're doing modeling because you're basing, you're taking reality and changing it into some, some sort of uh, model of the system. You're simplifying the system. Modeling is developing an approximate mathematical description of something more complicated and then developing it at some level of sophistication that it's useful. Then simulation utilizes computational methods to obtain predictions of the process performance. So a lot of people do modeling and simulation. Um, here's a quote here on the bottom uh, from uh, the uh, ANES report, the uh, BES uh, uh, report on nuclear energy systems from a few years ago. And they say modeling and simulation enhance our understanding of known systems. They provide qualitative and quantitative insights, guidance for experimental work, and produce quantitative results that replace difficult, dangerous, and, or expensive experiments. And this last bullet is a little bit dangerous. Uh, very much want to say advanced modeling and simulation do not replace the need for experiments. You will always have to do experimentation, both to get the parameters to feed your models, but then also to, to validate the models. I, you know, I, I noticed in the slides as we move ahead in the, in the course, I saw the, the quote that all, model, all models are wrong and some models are useful, and that's absolutely the case. We have to keep that in mind. Models are useful tools, but they're not, you know, you still need real data to, to, uh, for your modeling. Okay, so modeling and simulation uh, of nuclear separations is primarily focused historically on solvent extraction, because that's where the, the bulk of the separations is in aqueous uh, processes. And you've seen, you know, basically what happens in, in solvent extraction in earlier talks, where you're, you're looking to take these uh, uh, target species and, and capture them in a, in a uh, solvent, and you can write uh, kind of mass action equations for this process, and then you can set up, you know, an equilibrium a uh, uh, relationship which uh, basically products and reactants and put the uh, coefficient on the on each of these uh, you know like you did in in uh, in your chemistry classes um, 
And so here, this, this, real, this can be used to explain the relationship of an equilibrium in a, in a solvent extraction process. And uh, in the past, uh, here's an here's a example from the, the 60s where this was done. You get uh, experimental results for um, e equil the equilibrium relationships, and then you have operating lines for uh, uh, your mass trans, or basically for your uh, uh, mass balance. And so uh, originally, the solvent extraction process is predicting how you're going to move the species across, uh, uh, move the species in your system was done graphically using uh, uh, just graphical approaches. And then since then, we've taken and translated this to computational approaches. Now, what complicates things are that simple uh, equilibrium expression, nothing is simple, everything's non ideal. And so if you move forward to the to here's a, a, a model from the, the 70s, where again, they're doing these equilibrium relationships. Here's uh, partitioning of uranium, thorium, uh, nitric acid. You can see that there, there are these equilibrium relationships that are, uh, you know, the product in the organic phase and then the, the aqueous organic phase TVP and then aqueous phase uh, uh, species. You see, it's, it's related to the concentrations of these species in those phases. But then if you look, these uh, constants then actually are, are um, functions that are complicated functions that then depend on this mu, which this mu then is a, is a function of the concentrations of species in solution. So basically, this is a way to try to take into account the non-ideality of the system. Okay, so, so this is an empirical fit which works pretty well. So in, in just about every case, what you're going to find is you, ha you have to take some sort, you have to make some sort of fit. Okay. So if you go to a more complex thermodynamic approach, what you'll find is instead now we're fitting a solubility parameter or something else that's, that's a more thermodynamic quantity, but still you, these aren't all well, uh, 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 they're not all f f fundamental um, uh, quantities that you can that you can look up, but looking back at at these relationships, they do a pretty good job over the over the concentrations uh, of concern for the target species. This is a looking at the concentrations uh, uh, concentration of uranium uh, across the stages of a uh, solvent extraction bank, and you can see uh, over several orders of magnitude the experimental points match pretty well with the with the model. And then you can see it, it deviates at the lower concentrations, and this could be for several things. It could be carryover of solvent. It could be uh, analytical problems. But it also more likely is you've done these fits at the higher concentrations where the species are in concentrations where you're uh, uh, concerned, much more concerned about them. So uh, if that's the case, then your fit's not as likely to be as good when you're at, at the lower concentrations. Okay, so as we move forward in time, uh, the uh, uh, generalized TrueX model, and then following that is the Amuse model at, at Argonne, uh, has done uh, has been one of the uh, approaches used uh, for predicting solvent extraction, and it's a widely used uh, equilibrium stage model. And so what it does is it combines thermodynamic uh, relationships, so they they do take into account some of the non-idealities in the aqueous phase uh, to predict distribution uh, of species. And of course, these are based on uh, experimental data. And then combining that with a mass balance. So you do the mathematics of the phase. The phases contact each other in these, in these solvent extraction contactors. They, they reach some equilibrium, and then you pass those species to the next stage, and so it does the accounting for the, for the mass balances. And so from that, if you do that, uh, that accounting, then you can predict, and I'm losing my pointer here, uh, you can predict across a set of stages uh, what the concentrations of different species will be. And so this allows you to explore uh, a number of different uh, scenarios, basically. And so here's some examples uh, Argon has used uh, to look at the design of a, of a solvent extraction process. And basically what they were able to do is look at a wide variety of, of uh, 
basically operating parameters and uh, not giving details on this basically. But under a wide variety of conditions, what they can look at is the, the concentrations. Here's a metal, metal concentration in the organic, for instance. You can look at one, one species in either organic or aqueous phase as you go throughout the system and then changing the parameters. So you use this model to look over a, a broad a range of scenarios. And uh, they told me how long it took to do, these, to do these simulations. It was quite a while because you have thousands of points here. But basically, it would take you a whole lot longer to do the experiments. And so what this allows you to do is at least go explore the sets of conditions and see um, where you might be in, in conditions that you don't want to be. Uh, it allows you to design instrumentation. You can use this to go predict, well, the concentration is going to be in this order here, so we need this type of instrumentation. could allow you to design a process control system. Uh, and then it can feed into uh, diversion detection type of uh, 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 analyses. Okay. I guess I'm moving. That particular one, well, there, uh, Amuse has several modules. I mean, it has a PureX module, a TrueX module. Uh, so there's several modules. Yeah, yeah. So there's probably six or seven different solvent extraction systems that they have. Okay. So now that was just the solvent extraction step, and uh, now if you're going to step up and do, a, do an entire plant, uh, back in the 80s, Bob Jubin and a team of his colleagues uh, had done a complete plant simulation uh, using Aspen. And this was, uh, you know, 700 streams, 32 different systems. You can you can read the different types of systems that were put in put into this. So there were descriptions simplified uh, by necessity, but the entire all the all the uh, systems in a uh, aqueous recycling plant uh, steady state simulation. But this was a very large simulation for the computers at the time. In fact, they had to break down the plant into several segments just to be able to run the, to run the system. Uh, but very useful for uh, basically getting a, a conceptual design of a, of a plan. Okay, now moving forward, what can we do now? We should be able to do more than that these days with the way computations have, have gone forward. And I'll give you one, one idea of something that's uh, currently being developed that, I, that looks very promising. And this is a Sandia Safeguards Performance Model. Ben Sapiti is uh, uh, the main uh, person on this. And what he's done is used uh, uh, MATLAB and Simulink to put together a model uh, of, of uh, uh, re recycle plant and the instrumentation. Okay, so uh, what it allows him to do is make the unit operations, a, 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 basically a box for each unit operation in a plant. Here's a, a storage and then chopper, dissolvers and hull washing, a centrifuge, a surge tank, accountability tank. Uh, downstream of here, he has a solvent extraction uh, system. He's, wow. <laughs> okay. All right, and so each of these is, a, is an operation. It gives a, some sort of description of the, uh, uh, of the operations in the plant. Now, albeit these are very simplified. And in fact, when you go to the solvent extraction uh, portion of the plant, he's used uh, just static splits uh, from a muse, and he's linked in a crude way to Cephas, which allows a transient calculation. Uh, so a lot of work, a lot more work needs to go in into this to provide more rigorous description of the processes, but still this is a, a great step forward because it allows you to then predict in a transient way. So you say, okay, let's let's go forward in time. You can see what what the what are the flows throughout this plant. You get the mass flow rate of each element and then the bulk liquid and solids flow rate. And you can set it forward in time and see what see what happens. Uh, coupled onto that then are these red red boxes are actual instrument instrumentations that hooked up. So he can say, okay, I'm going to put an instrument here, and here's the characteristic of this instrument. It has, uh, it's this accurate, it has this much noise on the signal, typically, and then uh, can then set up different accountancy 
uh, scenarios, let's say, let's say, what if I what if I put this set of instruments around here? What will I see? And then allow the allow the system to move forward in time. Okay. And the, oh yeah, the red block, the blue blocks are the instruments. Red blocks are diversion points. So he he can tweak on and off. What would happen if somebody turned a valve here or changed this flow rate or did something else? What would you see? Okay. And so then uh, you can run through different scenarios, and then uh, this just shows some examples of an abrupt direct diversion and a pro protracted direct diversion, and, and here is some measure of the inventory or the uncertainty in the inventory. Uh, the purple is the expected result, and then the yellow is what is seen by the instrumentation by using the, uh, using the, the instrumentation that he set up. And so. Uh, He's shown in, in some of his simulations that, yeah, if you put instrumentation at certain parts, parts of the point, you can do uh, kind of improve your real-time accountancy, or in principle, you could do that. So this is a useful concept. It's limited somewhat by what you can do with MATLAB and Simulink, and it's definitely currently limited by the, the amount of rigorousness or sophistication in each of those unit operations mod models. So there's certainly a lot of work that needs to go on to make those models more uh, robust. Okay, so basically, where are we in, in process modeling? Um, and I guess I caveat this. This is the state of process modeling for open uh, 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 programs, codes that are available. I'm not talking about industrial codes. I'm not talking proprietary codes or codes that are used uh, internationally that we can't get our hands on, basically. This is what people in this room could work, work with. Uh, solvent extraction, obviously, is the most developed because it's, most attention has gone there. It's been shown to be a useful aid in process development. Every, every solvent extraction uh, code currently has some sort of empiricism in them. Many species are not modeled well or not at all. I mean, obviously, you'll see the, the, the key components are modeled, but then trace species and some other, other species are modeled approximately or just not modeled at all. Uh, the leading codes use equilibrium stages, and this is a good approximation in most systems. If you're talking a mixer settler with long times and, uh, uh, you know, so the kinetics don't come into, into play in the, in the uh, hydrodynamics are not a not so much of a concern. That's probably a, probably a good uh, probably good approximation. But as we move towards centrifugal contactors uh, with short residence times and more complex hydrodynamics, that may or may not be uh, accurate enough for some systems. Uh, current codes do not do not predict well mass transfer reaction kinetics effects, the effects of micellization, third phase formation, radiolysis is. Uh, take into account in a few ways in an approximate way, but there, there's not a fully rigorous uh, uh, way to deal with that, and there are a few transient codes available. Um, other important processes are not well modeled. There's a few uh, legacy codes available from work in the 80s, for instance, uh, dissolver and acid recovery from, from off gas. Those are, there are some codes available, and actually we're making use of them now and trying to turn them into um, hook them up with our, our current plant level code models. And for the most part, the plant level, full plant models are, are crude. There's, uh, they're not fully transient, and, and the descriptions of each unit operation is, is, is simplified. And this, this uh, animation that's been going on over on the, the, the right side, that's basically just a visualization of, of the, what uh, Cephas process model will will do uh, showing concentration, both the aqueous and organic phase of uranium, starting up from no concentration in the entire, uh, in the entire solvent extraction banks and just filling up with, with feed. So it's showing the types of data that you would, you would like to be able to, to have. So if, you're, if there was a process upset, how does that propagate through the system? Can you predict that and, and see it? Okay, moving forward. Um, from the plant level, unit operation level, down to molecular modeling. Uh, how's, how's molecular modeling going to be useful? useful? Well, uh, 
One, one place it has been useful is in guiding the design of uh, solvent extraction uh, uh, separating agents. Uh, here's a number of the separating agents that are used in different processes. Uh, what you find is the structure of these molecules have a huge effect on how well they perform. You look at these very similar looking compounds, I mean, they, they have the same very similar looking uh, structure there, but the, the just minor changes in the architecture have a huge effect. Here's uh, binding affinity. You can see that it varies over seven orders of magnitude in, in this example. Uh, go down to the bottom here and uh, also see impacts on selectivity. You can see here very similar compounds, but they change four orders of magnitude and actually cha change the relative uh, affinity between uh, mercury and copper just by a slight change in the structure. And again over here with uh, uh, europium and, uh, and aluminum. Again, just, just minor changes in the structure here. The only thing that's changing is the length of this linkage between these two nitrogens. Okay, so if we could understand that, then maybe we can design molecules uh, more quickly. So before people like Ben Hay started doing this computer-aided ligand development, what you had to do was just through the um, intuition of, uh, of smart chemists, they come up with some candidate structures. And this is not in any way to downgrade smart chemists. They, they do a great job. However, you know, you're going you're gonna to identify hundreds of candidate structures, okay? And, and that's all right, but then you have to synthesize them and characterize them, and then you have to do a bunch of studies, and all this takes time and effort. Okay, so is there a way to accelerate this? And so the idea is, can you do some computational screening here to cut down the number of candidate structures and then actually use some molecular modeling to, to help you even, even more uh, accelerate that? Okay, so you can uh, optimize on binding affinity, selectivity, solubility, stability, cost, and primarily what's been done to date is optimize on binding affinity and, and selectivity. And so here's some, some examples, uh, uh, you know, Lumetta et al. at, at PNL uh, proved this. Okay, so what you're looking at here is on the x-axis, you're, you're seeing the actual uh, free energy change when you um, occupy the, the Occupy the, the bind the bind the target uh, metal in this case uh, strontium. This is this is computational on the x-axis. The y-axis is experimental. Okay, and so you can see a very good relationship between. Hey, if we have a, a lower energy, we get a better distribution coefficient. This is good. These models can't predict distribution coefficients, but they can provide ideas of trends. Okay, these these uh, computational models do these. Uh, binding of metals in a in a vacuum. Okay, they're not in a solvent. Okay, so you're not going you're not going to get a, a number of the effects, but they do help focus the work. Uh, here's another example where you see a, a molecule that's 10 million times more effective uh, by basically just by uh, well, right here by by putting this structure here, it makes the molecule much less flexible, and so then it it binds. It's it's prearranged to bind the the, the species. Okay, so that's kind of historical. Where were we? Um, recent workshops have have uh, indicated the the need for or the opportunity for modeling and simulation. Uh, won't read these in details, but it is given in your handout uh, links to these reports. But basically, they point out there's several places where modeling and simulation can help. Uh, a plant scale simulation. Uh, dynamic plant models are seen as really uh, uh, useful. Uh, primarily in the near term, I think it's more useful for a kinds of a safeguards analysis than it is for plant design. But down the road, when we when we get to designing plants, that'll be useful. Uh, computational fluid dynamics. We've seen previous talks that the, the fluid dynamics is is uh, vital in in these contactors. Predictive thermodynamics. Um, and as we move along, data management and visualization. So a few years ago, uh, Office of Nuclear Energy recognized the need for advanced modeling and simulation. And actually now, if you look at the uh, nuclear energy 
roadmap, you'll see that modeling and simulation is given an equal footing with experiments and theory. Um, and what we've been doing in the safeguards and separations portion is focusing on R&D objectives of any, both in objective three and four, which is sustainable nuclear fuel cycles, but also designing tools that could be useful for uh, safeguarding uh, systems of the future. And so the NEMS program, the Advanced Modeling and Simulation program, is looking at, has four uh, code efforts, or has had four code efforts, uh, reactors, fuels, separations and safeguards, and, and waste forms, and then some cross-cutting efforts on, on computational, uh, um, cross-cutting capabilities. Um, and so within the safeguards and separations scope, what we've been looking at is developing an overall plant level code. So we're looking at the scope, the head end, different separations processes, including aqueous, electrochemical, and then alternative approaches, integrated off gas treatment, and then the solidification and packaging at the, of the products. Integrated with that, though, would be safeguards, so the instrumentation models and then dynamic inventory analysis. So developing the tools such that those people that will be designing uh, or considering uh, different fuel cycle options can, will have a toolkit at their, at their disposal where they can mix and match the different models and allow them to, uh, to uh, compare. And so the goal of this effort is a predictive capability uh, for performance and safeguards aspects of reprocessing plants. Okay, so the, the vision of this is a dynamic plant level simulator, and so that's kind of depicted by this blue tier. Okay, this is a plant level model that encompasses, encompasses the entire plant and its integrative safeguards or a portion of the plant. Um, one of the key uh, points here is these models should be extensible, interoperable, and hierarchical. Basically, design them today so that you can use them in many different uses for the future. Design them with where is computing going to go, not uh, make them very limited. Um, open source toolkit uh, rather than some sort of uh, uh, proprietary licensable approach, but enable the use of controlled modules. So the idea is, okay, we'll develop this overall toolkit, but if you have a special program that you want to link into it, you can and keep it proprietary. Um, so the idea is an overall plant toolkit, but where you need it, then you have more detailed models. So these would be models of specific unit operations at a more detailed level, and then down at this bottom tier would be where you would actually do things like a molecular model where you need to get a parameter to then feed up to your, to your uh, higher scale models. Okay. it's a lot of stuff on this slide, and I don't intend to walk through it all, but this is just an idea of what's being done right now for main unit operations. And the idea is to get this all in a common scheme. If you go look at the different models that are out there from you know, decades ago, you'll have a very dedicated model, okay? And so if you want to make a change to it, like if you say, I want to change from a centrifugal contactor or a mixer settler to centrifugal contactor, you're going to have to go dig in there and do an awful lot of work. So the idea is, can you develop on a, on a common framework such that you have an overall, let's say, and this is, this is an example of a dissolver, overall contactor, which gives, the, gives how the different materials are contacting, a mass and energy balance, any kinetics, and thermodynamics. Each of these is a separate module. So if you say, well, hey, you know, I don't want to use the thermodynamics from, let's say, Amuse. I'm going to use some other thermodynamic uh, uh, predictor. I can just plug that in there rather than starting from scratch. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, hone in a little bit just on what's happening in solvent extraction since that's where most of the development work has been uh, going on historically. If you look at solvent extraction, what makes it tick? You're obviously, you're interested in what happens up here at the at the meter length scales and the hour time scales. How does this thing perform macroscopically? But if you look, there's a lot of different things going on that uh, uh, at different scales that affect the performance. Yeah. 
ultimately you have you have these different fluid phases that are contacting and, and the materials are, are are passing between the phases so how you contact these how you contact these fluids is important if you go down one scale now at the interfaces that's where the action occurs at some point this material has to go from one phase to the other phase and it has to go through an interface understanding what happens at the interface that's at a molecular level and then actually uh, if you want to become more predictive, it's can you do things down at the molecular level to feed, provide parameters up to, to understand what's happening uh, at the upper scales. Okay, so here's, here's some examples. This is some work that Kent Wardle of Argonne's been doing in modeling the fluid dynamics in centrifugal contactors. And he's been using um, an open source code called OpenFoam. He started with some commercial codes and recognized they just don't have enough capability to do what he wants to do. Um, the, these are just stills from some of his uh, uh, animations where here the red is basically a surface where there's an organic phase. The green is uh, an interface and then the blue is blue is an air interface. Okay, and what you see here, actually, this is a very interesting point. This is at the top of a contactor where the liquids are, liquids are coming out and going to the collector. And through the animation, or through the simulations, he was actually, they were seeing some problems in, in uh, testing, actually, at Savannah River. They were seeing some siphoning. And he was able to show that it was a, a, a siphoning effect that if they were able to vent the top of these contactors, they would be able to... Uh, keep the siphoning from occurring and that that actually uh, proved to be proved to be uh, useful so that's that's one example of how these how these are useful and here's why I've got the animation yeah. so here you're seeing the the red red phase there is your organic phase and then the kind of clear bluish is your water phase okay and so this kind of gives a, a macroscopic view of what's going on in these contactors so it's very it's a, a very complicated flow I mean you can see it's, it's mixing around uh, you're getting uh, large globules you know um, and very dynamic, and actually, if you if you watch this, the the level goes up and down. Now, if you run this at different different phase ratios, different speeds, what you'll see is you'll have different levels in the in the uh, in the contactor, which means you have different volumes in the contactor, means you have different residence times. So this can do a lot towards predicting how much is how much holdup you have in these in these systems. Uh, what what's the dynamic behavior? But one thing that's important here is you only see the large globules. This this can get down to a scale on the order of 50, 50 microns. But we know the droplets are much smaller than that. At the at the current time, this can do macroscopic uh, fluid behavior, but it can't get down to the microscopic fluid behavior. And so a current uh, focus is how do you link models down at the droplet size scale with this more macroscopic multi-phase flow modeling. Already this is a, this is a, a very large simulation. Um, so now how do you how do you move forward? And so let's go back to the slides. How do you validate it? I'll show you some some efforts that are being done experimentally uh, in, a, in a few slides. But yeah that's that's great. How do you validate? And even and how do you get parameters in there? Even where do you get the parameters? To put in there, yeah, it's yeah, calibrating is is extremely difficult, yeah. And so here show some other examples of the different performance you get with with uh, here it's looking at uh, the veins at the bottom of the contactor, four veins, eight veins, and then if you have curved veins, and you'll see uh, under the same conditions, and you obviously see a, a much different liquid level, uh, much different contacting. Here you see very little red fluid you only see the green so it gives you some uh, some idea of what's happening experimentally and then you could obviously tweak the design design of these veins and then uh, predict performance so it help you guide 
your 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 design. Okay, so here's some things going towards validation. This is these are some experiments that are going on. There's some experiments at Argonne and some at Idaho right now on uh, uh, electrical resistance tomography. So what they're doing is putting a bunch of electrodes around these contactors, a huge number of electrodes, and then uh, probing the connectivity between all the electrodes systematically uh, using a commercial uh, uh, tomography device. And what it allows them to do is under different sets of conditions then get, get phase maps. At least you can map out where's the conductive fluid, where's the non-conductive fluid. It's not, it's not going to get down to the droplet level. It's, it's still going to be a very macroscopic. And uh, so here's one map that they, that they collected. Uh, and so here you're looking at a horizontal slice down below the rotor, so you look down in the in the veins, and you can see where there's uh, basically a distribution of conductivity, and you can see where there's uh, conductive zones, non-conductive zones. So the non-conductive zones are heavy in the organic, and the conductive zones are are heavy in the aqueous. Uh, but this is a far way from from actually validating a, a model because this is uh, time averaged over on the order of a hertz, and as you saw, when, you, when this thing is spinning at 3,600 RPM, there's a whole lot more action going on than that. So this is kind of a smeared uh, uh, experimental um, investigation. All right, so here's another potential way to validate, and this is high-speed video imaging. Now, the issue here is when you see these contactors running, they're opaque. I mean, it's an opaque, it's a cloudy mixture. Okay, so high-speed video is only going to see the first, you know, the, the first few microns or uh, uh, depth. Well, tens of microns depth. But if you go use a high-speed uh, video system, and this is a, these are about 5,000 frames per second, but what what allows you to take these images is more the very fast shutter with uh, with a uh, matched strobe light, okay, LED strobe lights, and you know, to our knowledge, it's the first time this type of uh, data has been seen. So these droplets are on the order of 10, 10 nanometers in the in this case, and they're zipping by at about nine meters per second, uh, and you can see a big difference in the in the fluid flow that's going on. Here you've got on the order of 10 nanometer uh, droplets, and this is organic droplets in an aqueous continuous phase, and over here is aqueous droplets in organic phase, but then you see these big round uh, objects, and what those turn out to be is air bubbles. Okay, so you have entrained air bubbles. So this type of detail wasn't captured in that, in that large scale uh, model. A fluid dynamics model, so there's a lot more work to be done. Now the other thing you can do with these, this type of video imaging is then use computer analysis of the images to, the, to then get, you know, pick out the droplets, pick out the bubbles here. You can tell the bubbles because they have a higher contrast. Um, so here is video and then here's the computer aided basically extraction of the bubbles. Uh, here is uh, on, on the bottom, and I'm losing my pointer again, the droplets, and then so you can see the matching, the matching frame. You can do the droplets, and what you can do here then is get a size distribution, which then feeds a surface area. You, know, you can get an interfacial surface area, uh, and also allow velocity tracking. So this is an interesting approach. The issue there, of course, is you're only going to get the, the regime near the, near the outer surface of the, of the contactor. And conceivably, I suppose you could do it from the inside and get the get the inside surface. So it's going to be limited, but at least this is this is something again where you can really uh, get some data that's good for validation. Okay, recently, you know, I talked about what what had been done in solvent extraction agent design. More recently, uh, uh, Valmore Diomeda has been working with Ben Hay, and he has parallelized the code that was used for uh, agent design, and so. It's thousands of times faster. I mean, the previous capability, you could do a limited analysis. You could do about tw 10 to 20 ligands, and it would take you days, and turn that to a process where they can do 1,000 ligands in, a, in one and a half hours on a, on a supercomputer. So you can crank through a bunch more molecules. 
Uh, now, they say that this, uh, these are the top five molecules for americium that they've found so far. And so, okay, so you can see them. What's interesting is then they went and, t and synthesized some of these, and, and the top scoring one were uh, very susceptible to hydrolysis. So even though they score well in the computer, when you go try them out, first experiment says, oh, this is no good. Let's go back to the drawing board. Okay, so where are we on this? It's basically adding quantum mechanics. And so using quantum mechanics will improve the scoring. Um, and there's an awful lot of uh, computational work that has to be done to connect this host designer uh, program to existing uh, quantum mechanics codes. But then the next step is moving along. These are these empty boxes here is all these things are taking place in a, in a vacuum. Okay, now to really be predictive, what you have to do is take these molecules and put them in a solvent and then actually have the, have the interactions with the solvents and the other, and the other species. <coughs> but that's a frontier. That's, that's not happening right now. Okay, so now if we look at what is happening at, at the interfaces, what are happening with the molecules, you can use molecular dynamics to get, get some clues. Uh, try to understand what's happening. Uh, you know, we do not have, we've been doing solvent extraction for years and years and years, but we really don't know what's happening at the molecular level. We have good ideas, but we don't know fully. So here's some, some work that's been going on, uh, looking at molecular dynamics of a, of a solvent extraction. And so I think I have a blow up of this, of this video on the, next, on the next slide, so I won't spend too much time trying to get you to see this. But basically what you're seeing on these slides are uh, kind of a preliminary calculation, but what you've got is uh, a water phase here and then an organic phase. This is uh, tributophosphate and dodecane. So it's, you know, it's a, a typical solvent. And we're looking at uh, uranyl nitrate extraction. So the magenta, the big magenta atoms are uranium. Okay, and so in this, in this simulation, you're seeing all the, all the atoms, and then down here, you're, we've taken all the organic tails off, so you can actually see the uh, phosphate groups on the tributophosphate. You can see the nitric acid, and you can see the uh, uranium. And what, well, if you know what to look for, I suppose, what you'll see is that the uranyl are, are going to come to the interface between the organic and the aqueous. The other thing that you'll see is the tributophosphate Right in here, you see all these yellow dots. There's an awful lot of yellow dots right at the interface, and then you don't you see this kind of vacuum right here, and that's the the solvents lining up with their polar groups at the at the interface, and then their organic tails sticking out, which kind of surfactant behavior. And I guess you'd you'd expect that. Now, what's kind of interesting is as this goes on, what you see is that these tributophosphate head groups are having a heck of a time grabbing, and I can, you can see it right in here, uh, you can see they have a heck of a time pulling them across that kind of vacuum until uh, you see they can kind of bridge and then they pull it across. And so certainly this is not, this obviously has not been a fully calibrated model and so it's, it's not fully predictive, but what it does do is give you some sort of insight. This could give a solvent designer some sort of insight of, aha, maybe I need to make these things bridge across this, uh, this organic rich layer, or maybe I need to change my solvent so I don't have that uh, barrier. And so this is a little, this will blow up a little bit more uh, of, the, of the same simulation. And so basically, I guess right in here was where that, where that action was. But these, these simulations, this is a very large simulation, I think 18,000 molecules in this, and this is you know, several days of supercomputer time to do picoseconds of, of reality time. So the prospects of being able to say, computer, throw all these molecules in a, in a box and tell me what's going to happen in this entire uh, reprocessing plant. Okay, that's, well, not in most of our lifetimes is that going to happen. So it's, it's really 
can these models give us insight that allow us to accelerate what we're going to do experimentally, I think, is where the, where the value is. Right, and it's, uh, well, anyway, this, so this is just showing the, it's showing one of those urineals and how it's being coordinated uh, through, the, through the time steps. I'm not going to spend time on that. Okay, so where is this going forward? I remember uh, the last time we gave this course, uh, Gordon Jarvin and said, well, heck, that's a really complicated system. Why don't you do something more simple? And absolutely right. Okay. Okay, so what uh, this, in a, any university programs uh, project, and so this is Bameen Komami and uh, Belmore Diameda collaborating, what they've been doing is taking that same system and making it a whole lot simpler. So we're just looking at water extraction, okay? But but the point of their work is to look at the force fields that are used. So use a bunch of force fields that are out there in the literature and try to calibrate them or use the best ones such that they can actually reproduce some results. And so over here you can't see too much of it, but here's a density results and gee, I can't even see how close it is. But they're within a, a few percent on density. Okay, so that's all right. And then uh, I just saw a paper that they're preparing where they're they did a diffusion coefficient, and they're within 20% on a diffusion coefficient. So not great, but at least now we're providing some calibration. How good are these models? How, and uh, what do we have to do to change the, to get better models? And what it comes down to is these force fields. So remember when I said previously it all comes down to somewhere you've got an approximation or an empiricism or something. And, and so you've changed where's the approximation. The approximation right now is in these force fields. Unless you want to do a full quantum calculation to get everything, you know, you, you're basically, you, what force fields are you going to use to, to uh, do these predictions? But, uh, you know, good progress, actually. Another uh, university program project, uh, when I had said that they're having problems resolving the small droplets in the centrifugal contactor model, well, here's some work that's being done by Jim Glim of SUNY Stony Brook and that with Belmar Diameda, again, from Oak Ridge, where they're looking at uh, doing this front tracking uh, flow modeling, and that's where you're shearing these droplets at some high rate, but the, this very advanced computer model is able to keep track of those interfaces. And uh, so, you know, this just shows uh, some pictures of what these droplets may look like in a very high shear field where they're kind of pancakes and being distorted and things. So um, this is just, uh, you know, frontier work at this time, but it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, and hopefully applicable as we move along. Okay, completely different topic, but uh, we heard this morning about electrochemical processing, and so we do have some work going on in uh, modeling of electrochemical processes. Uh, an electro-refinery, you can imagine there's multiple processes going on there. You've got uh, electro-dissolution, you've got electro-hydrodynamics, uh, electro-deposition composition, electrode morphology, thermodynamics, electrochemical reactions, all this going on in this in this complex molten salt environment. Okay, so um, uh, Jinsu Zhang and Jim Willett of Los Alamos and Argonne are working on developing a model for uh, these electro refiners. And basically, they're, they're trying to take into account each of these things. Um, and so far, they've been looking at, uh, they've been using available data on the activity and diffus diffusion coefficients, assuming that their deposit acts as a, as a uh, ideal solid solution, and what they've been showing is that they can get co-deposition uh, at the solid cathode. We, we heard this early, earlier this morning about these co-depositions. Uh, so here they're doing zirconium, uranium, plutonium alloys, and uh, the dots here are actual experimental data, and then you can see the contributions of the different uh, zirconium, uranium, plutonium, and the different curves, and they add up the added uh, uh, here, y-axis is current, and this is applied potential, and you can see it, it matches relatively well. So they're, they're on the right track, but obviously they're, this is only preliminary work, and so their target by 2015 is to have the, the kinetics of phase morphology and full property data into this, into this model. Okay, a uh, couple slides on work that's going on in modeling of safeguards. Um, 
one one approach that's uh, being considered to basically connect up with this plant level model is this neutron balance approach for the hidden safeguards. And the idea here is um, you can measure the uh, uh, neutrons from curium, and then if you know the burn up, you can then ratio the curium and plutonium. So if you know the concentrations of different uh, you, you know the ratios of different parts of the plant, you can actually use neutron transport uh, calculations then t to uh, see what your instruments would actually, uh, predict what your instruments will be seeing and what does that mean in terms of a, a safeguards uh, calculation. And then the other instrumentation modeling is uh, uh, hybrid K-edge modeling. And basically here is uh, using uh, simultaneous x-ray analysis and basically deconvoluting the spectrum that you get out of it to then say what are my concentrations of, of my actinides. And so then the idea is here is could you then take this plant level model, you know the compositions that are there, then you could say here's what my hybrid K-edge would see, how good is my, how good is my measurement. And then one last topic here, and this is kind of way out there, but the idea that, okay, we have these process models, but we also, the entertainment industry has been doing wonderful things with visualization. Okay, so you can do real, uh, photorealistic uh, uh, graphical representation of these things, so you can really visualize what's going on. Um, here's some stills of a, of a fully 3D representation of the mixer settlers at the uh, REDC at Oak Ridge, and this was done by uh, Los Alamos uh, team basically just took photos of the, of the equipment and some design um, drawings and then we're able to build a 3D model of these things. So you can go up to these in, in your computer. If I was able to have my computer here, I'd, I'd pull it up, but you can, you can actually walk around these things, okay? And so now that's fine. It's, it's kind of a picture, but the, these, these, uh, uh, Visualizations are also, they have a lot of number crunching capability back there, so they can interact with process models. They don't have to be just these static things or just, uh, um, you know, pretty pictures. And so the idea is, you know, as we develop greater, well, greater process models, you can have, have the process model running in the, in the background, go manipulate the environment, and then see what's happening. And so this is just, these are just some uh, pictures showing that, yeah, you can put, you can put an awful lot of detail. So the, uh, the uh, computer-generated images on the right look an awful lot like, the, lot, lot like reality. And here's just one simple example, you know, of where they've created one of these uh, three-dimensional realities and then took a source and walked it by some monitors, virtual monitors, and what would those monitors see? Yeah. So then the idea is, okay, you could do this uh, in a separations plant, too. You could say, okay, I've got my operating equipment operating this way. Back behind there, I've got my process model. Okay, so I can go up and change this valve or do something, and I can see what's happening. The, the process model is back there generating in a, in a real-time way what's, what's happening, and you can see it in the, in the visualization. So that's, that's down the road. The capability is there. It's just has this been hooked up. It hasn't been hooked up yet. And so, uh, two things I want to do here is just basically say um, modeling and simulation have provided significant input to the development of reprocessing systems. Uh, with increasing advancement, they could do even greater, uh, greater things. The other thing I want to do is acknowledge the input of several people, multiple people. The, most of the stuff that you saw here was, was from them. Um, and, I'm grateful to them for, for their input. And with that, if there's any questions, I'd be willing to answer them. <laughs>